something quite profound happened to me. I had a dream, a very lucid dream, where I was channeling the ascended master we know as Maitreya. And I was channeling him in front of an orchestra <laughs> who, was who were playing a, a piece of music composed for the situation. And it was very shocking to me. And I mean, I was aware of other people channeling Maitreya, particularly Benjamin Krem, and prior to that, Krishnamurti. I knew those stories. But the fact that I might be doing it too, I mean, let, let me use plain language. It totally freaked me out. Welcome to Soul Explorers. With your host, Gary Langley and Sally Taylor. Welcome to Soul Explorers. We're your hosts, Sally Taylor. My name is Gary Langley, and today we have Gordon Finn with us. Gordon is an out-of-body traveler. He does rescue work. He's written 12 books, which you can find on Amazon and probably other places as well. His latest book is Moving Through Many Dimensions, and I'm in the middle of it right now, and it's a wonderful book. Uh, Gordon, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Gary. Uh, you know, really pleased to be here. Good to have you. We're really excited to spend some time with you today, Gordon. Could you start us off with telling us just kind of the short story version of how you came to the work that you're currently doing? I had a typical British teenager hood in the 1960s, uh, 64, 65, 66. Only child, well, not in my both elder sis sisters had left home, married, and I was at home with my parents alone. And I turned immediately from about 1964 into this pop music crazed teenager. My life was consistent. In 1967, I cared more about Sgt. Pepper, Jimi Hendrix, and Pink Floyd than anything that was going on in the world. And, you know, just like a teenager, I mean, I did my school studies, yada, yada, yada. So just to give you that image, and I say that because a lot of, um, when I got to Canada, which uh, was in 1968 after my father passed, I, w I entered another world. And part of that world was watching American network television news. I'd come from a very happy, prosperous Britain. Things went downhill in the 70s, but I plugged into this civil rights, Vietnam War, eruption of activity and it was like a real shock i mean obviously one gets used to it but i just want to portray that for you canada had its own political problems at the time with quebec separatism and uh, bombs going off and people getting kidnapped so anyway um, my father had died uh march 68 and within a few months this was emphysema he was quite young i felt uh what we now call lucid dreams but i didn't know what they were called then and in those lucid dreams, I was sitting with him quite calmly talking. And what one of the things he, he said and repeated was, try to imagine I've gone on a long holiday. So this was a puzzle, of course, at the time. It's not a puzzle now. But I just kept that to myself. I had a few dreams like that. Then there's the, all the turbulence and challenge of moving to another country, another high school, yada, yada, yada. And uh, about after being in Canada about mm, two years, maybe even less, I uh, was already a bookstore fellow, and I discovered that book by Anthony Borgia, Life in the World Unseen, that is so popular. Of course, I didn't know that then. I just read it. And of course, that put it all into place, you see. And um, that helped me. Uh, and a few years after that, I started reading, uh, I came across Toronto at that, those days, like any big American city, North American city, was a great fund of used bookstores. You could find anything. And I started reading theosophy, more spiritualism, um, some more um, occult stuff, more esoteric stuff, you know, uh, Rosicrucian, different, different things. And also, I should also mention, the books from Findhorn in Scotland appeared. 71, 72, 73, all about nature spirits and Davis. And of course, having come from Scotland, I'm like, what is this? 
you know, it was quite remarkable. So that all fit in. You know, I'm reading the Finhorn Garden and Dorothy McLean's talking to Davis. And then a week later, you know, I'm reading some theosophy or I'm reading some spiritualism. So just to give you uh, a broad picture of what was influencing me then, right? I also read uh, several uh, books by the British composer and occultist Cyril Scott. He's not so well known, but his books are very influential in that he, his wife, who was a psychic, channeled one of the Ascended Masters. And those channelings were, as you can imagine, somewhat beyond the average kind of spiritualist communication. So I was influenced by that. And many, other, oh, of course, the Seth books, of course. We were all reading those in the early 70s. I can remember going to cafes and sitting down with uh, Seth Speaks and talking to friends excitedly over coffee about what all that meant. Because it was, it was a real mind blower at the time. And um, I know people are still discovering them now. That's great. But for me, it was the mid early to mid 70s. So all these things kind of moved in together. And as the years went by, living a, a fairly normal life, a sort of a hippie artist type with in the in the 70s, living in the country with other oh, sculptors, uh, uh, painters and musicians. People, I just seemed to gather around those kinds of people. And um, much uh, friends, you talk about art and music and uh, literature. A political consciousness developed. I remember when there was the uh, revolution against uh, Salvador Allende and, and Chile, and we all stopped buying Chilean wine because we were all so upset about it. I mean, it's just a small, a small thing, you know. And um, being in Canada, of course, we had American fellows coming up here getting away from the draft and stuff. So that influenced just politically and socially, you know, you got to see the other side of life. We were quite safe and they were like, man, we got to get to Canada. And we were happy to have them. So anyway, um, that was there. I had uh, occasional lucid dreams of a fairly esoteric nature where having done some reading, I understood sort of what was going on. I felt like I was being trained for something, but I didn't know quite what. And I would have dreams like finding myself on a lawn with a lot of other people sitting cross-legged, and we were learning how to spin. So you're sitting cross-legged in a sort of a, a grassy meadow, and you start to spin, and then you take off into the sky. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, what's this all about? And um, so odd things like that. And um, other things, another little, you could tell I was being tested. And I knew this from my reading. One of the things they will do is have you in your astral body fly through a forest fire. And if you panic and think, oh, my God, I'm going to get burnt and go back to your body, you've kind of failed the test. You're supposed to remember that you're in your astral, astral body. So there's a number of tests like this. And fortunately, I seem to have passed that one. <laughs> there's others where the... Um, a guide or a, a senior guide will create a little demon figure so that you can actually, you get out of your body and it's in your bedroom and it starts fighting with you, like tenaciously fighting with you. And you have to realize again, that this is a, 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 an illusory being, but the, the illusory being puts up such a fight, it scares the bejesus out of you. <laughs> and you go back to your body and wake up going, <laughs> oh, what was that? You know? So let me and ask then, you a quick question gordon if you don't yes. mind yeah. um so with all of this lucid dreaming yeah. that you were experiencing was yeah. it something that you ha were studying and actually working to experience or was it happening spontaneously to you well I, I was i'm a fanatical reader sally so like i said living near toronto and getting all access to all kinds of used bookstores with really good collections of stuff. The stuff that I mentioned and more, there's things I'm not mentioning because I can't remember, but there was all kinds of esoteric, like Dion Fortune, you're familiar with her at all? Her books were quite a revelation too. She was an occult teacher in Britain in the 1930s and 40s. Our books are all still in print. And she talks about all these sort of things, talking to Ascent Masters and practicing meditation and projecting and all this sort of thing. So the literature's there. So you have an experience and you go, well, that kind of fits in with what I read, you know, and and they were occasional. I'm, I'm talking about maybe four or five of these in a year in the 70s and 80s and 90s and just kind of moving along with my life. 
and uh, doing you know different adventures. At a certain in 1991, the crop circle started, and these the books I was the looks the stuff I was reading was uh, it was all in the south of England, an area that I knew quite well from a previous visit. So I'm looking at these crop circle images and going, I know where that is. I've been on that road. So by 1991, 92, I, I took a trip over, went to a conference and uh, got obsessed with the crop circles and the people that came from all over the world to see them. It was a real gathering of the tribes. It really was, you know, you're with all these people that don't believe the newspapers, that don't believe the governments. They're totally into spirit and crop circles, right? So this really reinforces this sense of belonging to something that's out of the mainstream. And that was it was really quite wonderful, as well as actually lying down and meditating in a crop circle, which was amazing. The um, uh, I think what they do is they raise your personal vibration. I really believe that's what they do. So I was I went over to England five times in the nineties, and enjoyed you know visited my relatives and went over to Amsterdam for a little fun and different things. But by the end of the nineties, in fact by two thousand and one, I knew I had changed in some way. And I remember being at a millennium party and saying to an old friend, um, somebody I'd known for many years, I said, I think I can do distance healing. <laughs> sure. And she said, well, why don't you try it then? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Do I, do I charge? Do, what do I do? So that kind of precipitated me into that. And then uh, my first book, Eternal Life and How to Enjoy It, was uh, uh, late 1998. And the Occasional lucid dreams turned into this sort of nightly explosion of lucid dreams. And I knew I had to write about them. And that was why I was being given, like they were forcing me, go on, look at this, look at this. Around that time also, a lot of um, the first flush of near-death experience books were coming out and the publishers were really jumping on it. There was quite a lot. So I was quite aware that there was a whole new crowd of people were interested in the afterlife because these books were selling quite well. And I'd read all the old, most of the old spiritualist stuff from the, you know, the turn of the centuries, the 30s and 40s, and was aware of A, how useful they were, but B, how old fashioned they were. So my first book is an attempt to update that notion of a, a guided tour of the afterlife by including modern consciousness and the way people were now not the way people were in 1920 or the way people were in 1890, which, of course, you know, is quite different to us. And, um, I mean, there's no homosexuals in the old, uh, in the, you know, that. There's no divorced people. There's, you know, there's no people going to, well, there are actually, some of the theosophists talked about the fate of people that go to brothels all the time. But um, generally, they're sort of clean and tidy and well-behaved. Yeah. which is fine. They're real, but they're not who we are now. So, so my first book is all about that. So Gordon, you obviously were having lucid dreams, which yes. uh, evolved into full out-of-body experiences. And then yeah. uh, I believe you had told me that you uh, utilized some tools initially, like Hemisync, to yes. help get you into that state. The uh, body asleep, mind awake. Um, what a wonderful tape. I love it. Yeah. And the out-of-body experience is a little different than lucid dreams. So, you know, it's, tell me if I'm being accurate here. For me, yeah. lucid dreaming is I know I'm dreaming in the mm. dream, but I'm not in control of it. Whereas out-of-body experience is like the next step. So you began to study, I think, some of Bill Monroe's work from you know the the institute mm. in virginia and yeah. um and also bruce moen's work so very much that began to hone your abilities to have full mm -hmm. body experiences go to different realms and mm -hmm. do rescue work so can we kind of look at sure. Sure. how how that transpired yeah the first book eternal life and how to enjoy it was all about lu remembered lucid dreams and I'd remember chunks of lucid dreams and then meditate and ask to, to be helped to remember more. And that's how that book evolved. It's more, more about my guide, Henry, than myself. But anyway, then after that, the book took five years to get published. I was circulating it for ages. It came out around 2004. Hampton Roads decided they liked it. 
around slightly before that time, I discovered Bruce Moen's website, afterlifeknowledge.com, and the Hemisync tapes, and that uh, was a great help. I would use them quite regularly. I found them very useful. And uh, headphones lying in my darkened bedroom, following a lot of Bruce's examples, doing fairly quickly retrievals. You know, the guides will give you an easy one. There was a child that died in a car accident and uh, his mother didn't. And he was desperate to see his mother running up and down. And I was you know, sort of like trying to grab a hold of a, a, sort of a five-year-old that's running up and down screaming. Um, that was a challenge, but I managed to do it. And then I said, okay, let's go see your mother. I didn't know where the mother was, but I, I said, I assume the guides did. And we took him and there's the mother's in a hospital bed recovering from whatever. And that seemed to help the child. Um, just to give you one example, many uh, other examples of retrievals, angry old ladies that uh, didn't like life and were resentful and uh, had Christian friends that they couldn't stand because they were so hypocritical. And uh, I found one lady in a darkened basement and had to argue with her <laughs> four or five times to get her to actually listen. Um, just to give you another slightly more difficult example. They're all in the books, by the way. So when I was using the Hemisync tapes, that really pushed me on quickly. And my second book, More Adventures in Eternity, as people will see, is pretty much all about that. Mm -hmm. And um, a great use of Hemisync. And my uh, projections and retrievals got significantly more complex. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like anything you practice, violin, piano, bicycle riding, you get good at it. Right. And I think we all inherently have the ability to do this, to have travel out of the body. I think fear maybe stops a lot of people from doing it. In fact, I was talking to a friend recently and I said something about an out of body experience. And she said, oh, that would freak me out. I'd think I was dead, but you are protected. Your guides do protect you. You are connected with the silver cord to the body, which even goes back. It's mentioned in the the bible even the silver cord yes so it's very safe that's one thing i want to get across to people that traveling out of body is safe i've had a few and uh spontaneously usually but uh, once or twice they were induced where i gave myself suggestion and now i'm working some with the hemi sync so we know a little bit now gordon about your story behind lucid dreaming and beginning to have out-of-body experiences when and at what point did you learn to channel and, and kind of what was the impetus for that there was channeling certainly in more adventures in eternity as i was working on fairly furiously on that book in 2004 five the first book had been accepted and had published and i was working it. they said oh they were interested in a second book so i worked on it and it was a very interesting time in my life, as uh, at the beginning of that year, my uh, then uh, partner's father uh, died of uh, a fairly serious illness. And uh, at the end of that year, my own mother slipped into uh, Dementia and died a little later herself. So th that book is uh, bookended by two uh, intimate deaths and which I was fairly closely connected in terms of meditation and you know that sort of a thing. A number of other issues came up and uh, that I was dealing with. At some point as I was working on my book, uh, you know, a few pages every day, my a future self of mine popped in and start wanted to be, be spoken to or wanted to be listened to. So there's a future self who calls herself Cassiopeia and is from about 100 years from now and talking away, yakking away to me, telling me about her life and uh, how interested she is in what I'm doing in that book in 2004, 2005. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm listening. I'm writing this down. <laughs> and uh, but it's a little wild, you know, things when stuff like that was happening and higher self would come in, you'll find there's several cases in that book where higher self just pops up and demands to be listened to. And there's some higher, higher self dialogues in that book. Um, not foreseen by me, they just sort of happened. So there was a, a period of great discovery, some of which was channeling. 
And, and you find uh, that the act of writing a book is actually very connected to channeling itself then, like channeling comes through in the process of writing? It did in that one. It didn't really come through that much in the first book, but it certainly came through in the second and the ones after. You're asking about channeling, so let, let me continue on that. Sure. Um, this, is, this is before all these YouTube things. They're, they're, this is like quite a few years before that because I, I didn't really know the functionality of YouTube and what you could do with it. So the channeling would be on text. A couple of years after More Adventures in Eternity, I, I did a couple of short books where I tried to sum up my knowledge. One's called The, the Word of God on the Afterlife. And the other one's called The Word of God on the Meaning of Life. And they're kind of short and sassy and snappy and try, trying to be a little lighthearted about such a serious subject. And then um, something quite profound happened to me. I had a dream, a very lucid dream, where I was channeling the ascended master we know as Maitreya. And I was channeling him in front of an orchestra <laughs> who, was who were playing a, a piece of music composed for the situation. And it was very shocking to me. And I mean, I was aware of other people channeling Maitreya, particularly Benjamin Krem, and prior to that, Krishnamurti. I knew those stories. But the fact that I might be doing it too, I mean, let, let me use plain language. It totally freaked me out. I thought, oh, no, I'm going to be channeling Maitreya. I can't stand this. It's too weird. I thought people aren't going to accept this. They're going to think I'm some kind of a jumped up egomaniac with, with charisma that wants, wants to form a cult, none of which I wanted to do, of course. Eventually, I did some meditations on it. When I, I tried to focus on Maitreya, this was weeks later. I really had to think about this. He presented himself to me as the ascended masters do. They will present themselves in a form that you are comfortable with. And he was sort of like uh, a favorite old uncle. Uh, not that I had, you know, I, you know, I had some uncles, but, you know, I mean, sort of like a well-dressed, casual Englishman sitting down in an armchair. And that's how he looked to me. And I asked him questions and basically it was, he said, Lord, we want to have as many people channeling me as possible, not just one or two special people. We want to have lots of people doing it because we tried it with Krishnamurti and Benjamin Krem and it got a little too personality oriented. So we want to do anybody. You, you're a bit of an intellectual, you're a bit of an artist. We want uh, mothers all kinds of people channeling the, this consciousness, not just one or two. So that's how I got talked into it. Because <laughs> it reduced my fear of, you know, all these cult leaders that are so charismatic and they're talking to God and they're doing all this stuff and all they're doing is accumulating money and real estate. We know that. And what we knew that even then. So that relieved me of my fears of that. So I went into that, and there's a little book called Jesus and the Christ that is channeling. That came out in 2007. And I would say it's probably the least well-known of my books. I think people are a little, ooh, what's he doing with this? That's a little strange, you know. <laughs> and I understand that. I just I just put it into the the psychic atmosphere of the planet for the New Age movement and see what people would, how they would react. When we talked about uh, doing this a couple of days ago, Gary, the first consciousness that I felt speaking to me, probably through a guide, was, in fact, Maitreya. And I thought, oh, oh are we really going to go that deep? I mean, it's quite a difference, quite a hop from, you know, Dennis Hopper or, uh, you know, a deceased musician like David Crosby or somebody that I've channeled recently to Maitreya. And, uh, but... Um, I was asked, I was told that it would be, that consciousness would be available if it fit into this conversation. And I'm now being told that he would like your permission to do so. He does not want to force himself on this video. Do you feel that that's appropriate? Absolutely. Absolutely. We would love to hear from Matreya. Okay, thank you. And I will, uh, it won't take me too long to tune in. He's right here or part, you know, an aspect of him is right here. Good day, friends, neighbors, and strangers around the world. 
any of you who may be listening to this broadcast. I present myself to you as one of the so-called Ascended Masters, who is always interested in the evolution of consciousness in all forms of sentient life on the planet. We and our helpers, such as Davis and angels, work with all forms of life, human, animal, vegetable, mineral, to encourage their growth into complexity and creativity. And we've been doing this all along. And as you may know from other sources, we are in a way graduates from the human earth life system of reincarnation. We have finished with our reincarnations. We're not any longer human. We are overseers, elder brothers, as we've often been called. We're certainly not deities. We're certainly not gods. We are here to assist. We are here to help. And we understand, having evolved ourselves, many of the issues and problems and turmoils that you humans on earth have to deal with every day. So we have not forgotten. Uh, many of our tasks are of a more cosmic nature to do with the flow of energies between planets and galaxies and need not be gone into here, but at least mentioned. And certainly our helpers, spirit guides, angels, devas, do a lot more work with you as humans than we do. We are, as we say, sort of supervisors, not interfering supervisors, but caring and loving and helping supervisors. What do we want from you guys? We want co-creators. We want you to be creative. We want you not to be limited and fearful and timid. We want you to enter into the full consciousness of your being and understand that you are immortal, eternal beings, not limited by physicality or mortality, even though it may seem so. Now, this is a common parlance amongst the New Age community. Uh, I realize that. We know that. The message has been spread for well over 100 years, a couple of hundred years. But we want to emphasize that. Do not forget that. Even though you may hear it over and over, it is true. You are unlimited, immortal, eternal beings with many more creative powers than you realize and are willing to use. You do have fears of arrogance and uh, power lust that are derived from bad choices in past lives, but we feel that you needn't be fearful of that now. What you may have done in Rome or Egypt or in the Middle Ages when uh, fear and arrogance and pride pushed you to let's shall we say, uh, not praiseworthy activities. You have learned from all that. You will not be repeating it. And if you even tempted to be repeated, you can look around the world and see those that are doing it right now and how foolish they look. There is, uh, because of your modern technology and interconnectedness, you can see this quite plainly for yourselves and only need the smallest reminder from someone like me. So understand that we understand and that we encourage you not to be afraid of being creative and powerful in a way that uh, utilizes compassion, mercy, and kindness. There is a way to do this. Do not look to the powerful around the world who do not take these attributes on board. You can and you will. So that is my brief message to you, friends and neighbors and strangers around the world. And hopefully the translation abilities of the internet will move this from English into other languages. 
Gordon speaks English and we understand that. We're not uh, uh, chastising him for, for being limited. And uh, he is one of many channels. He asks that I repeat that. He does not want to be any sort of charismatic, <laughs> you know, uh, leader of anything. He is just a messenger boy, as he said in his book. I am the messenger boy giving the message. Anyway, thank you for listening. And I wish you all great love and happiness and fulfillment as you work out your karma and your ambitions. God bless you all. Thank you for that beautiful message. Yes, thank you. Wow. Thank you, Matreya. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Gordon, an issue I tend to grapple with a lot is, yep. the issue, is the issue of reincarnation and how it transpires, because I've heard many from the other side say, it's not the way we on Earth see it in linear time, but that these lifetimes are happening simultaneously because essentially there is no time. I mean, we experience time in the linear. Do you have a thought on that? Oh, yes, yes. I, 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 I struggled with that quite deeply in my second book, More Adventures in Eternity. My feeling is there's two ways of looking at it. As reincarnating personalities on Earth that are thinking about these matters and meditating on them, we, I, I think we can come to understand that the linear model of a life in ancient Egypt, a life in Atlantis, a life in uh, Rome, a life in Greece, a life in any number of countries uh, where uh, other religions, you know, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc., China, Thailand, you know, yada, yada, they all have a function and they all teach us different things, different lessons. And um, the way to absorb those lessons right now is to uh, see it as a linear progression, even though that is merely a teaching method. Okay. If you, if you go to your higher self in meditation, or you sometimes people find themselves with their higher self in a lucid dream, um, but if you go in meditation, you will access higher self's way of seeing it, which of course is simultaneous. Higher self sees all this stuff at the same time. Sure. And so to me, it's the two ways of looking at it. And neither one is right or wrong. It, going to the higher self in meditation is extremely useful and educative, but you can't stay there all the time. No, no, you have to function in the world. And that's yeah. what um, communications I've gotten from the other side have always said, uh, whether it be a channeled message or a during a physical seance, the message I've always gotten is, yes, it exists, but not in the way that you really think of it on the earth plane. Yes, I, I, I tend to understand that, Gary. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then as some people that communicate from the other side now, we have to keep in mind, people aren't magically uh, enlightened and transformed because they're on the other side necessarily. Some say there is no reincarnation. Some say there is, but not the way we think. So I just wanted to get your opinion on that. And thank you for that. Very definitely. And I, I've covered this uh, quite extensively in a recent selection of short afterlife fiction that's published in the uh, Reality Unmasked website. Got a whole series of stories about people uh, uh, coping with their, their departure and arrival in spirit. And what, you, what I'm trying to communicate is different types of people in the different levels of spirit, let's just go with this, the various levels of the Summerland, all of which are very pleasant. Nobody twists their arm and says, oh, no, you got to take this course on reincarnation. Right. You know, nobody twists your arm to do anything. Right. And if you want to play golf and go to nice hotels and have great dinners and go to swimming pools and have a very pleasant, wonderful time with your loved ones and friends doing artsy things, and sportsy things, you can do that. Nobody sure. at any point is going to say, hey, listen, you, you got you got to find out about reincarnation. You're living in a world of illusion. Nobody says that. Sure. But what does happen is sort of like here on earth, where you go for a walk through town and you see a notice board, 
and somebody says, uh, mindfulness meditation practice, Wednesday evenings, come along, you know, and, and pe people see those and they go to their mindful meditation practice. It's the same in, in the astral plane. People put up little signs and go, come to this class. It's really interesting. Or yeah. a friend of yours will do it. As you know, as Sally knows, as we all know, there are many faithful Christians who do not believe in reincarnation. But when, and we're talking millions here, and when they get to the summer land, they might be living in a Christian heaven. They probably are. But that, uh, uh, accepting the ones that are fundamentalists that won't take any, on, any new ideas on at all, the, the more liberal Christians are interested in studying stuff. Sure. They definitely are. They take classes and all sorts of things. And at some point, they're going to take a class from a Hindu teacher. And the Hindu teacher or the new age lady is going to teach them about this stuff. Initially, they may end up in a consensus reality mm. that that is of their belief system and they can yeah. grow beyond that. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so that, that's what I have found in my many explorations where I just kind of you'll find some of my YouTubes are I'm just roaming around talking to people on different levels just seeing what they're thinking about and how they're, how, you know, they'll say, well, who are you? And I'll say, well, I'm just meditating. I'm, I'm in Canada. I'm alive. And I, I just like to come and talk to people. I learn a lot from those conversations because oh, yeah. most people are quite chatty. Some are a little sort of, oh, who's this weird guy? You know, but most people are quite chatty and friendly. Do you find that they know you're still in a physical body when they meet you because of some the- Some do and some don't. Some know how to look at the aura. Uh, yeah. and, and the vibe around you and then others don't they're, they're kind of you'll see chapters in the book where I'm uh, sitting in cafes talking to people about a film they've just seen or uh, a dance performance they've just seen and it's just like doing it here on earth you sit down you have a latte and you talk about what what's happening and they go man wasn't that dancing amazing I just loved it and you know and then some people will go you know, I don't think we've seen you here before because they're 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 with their 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 cultural bubble, and um, I go, no, I'm just visiting, and then others sort of catch on right away. They go, oh, you're just passing through, aren't you? That you know, it's a bit of both. Yeah, yeah. I have a quick question for you, and I'm asking this question because of personal experience. Uh -huh. Have you ever, either in the lucid dream state or the astral state, found yourself in a place of learning? Yes. Have you taken classes at night? <laughs> yes, uh, certainly years ago. But uh, I apologize if this sounds uh, arrogant, uh, uh, Sally. But most of the time, even 20 years ago, I was the one giving the classes. <laughs> so that, that kind of freaked me out because I'm still like the newbie using the hemisync tapes. And I'm like, why am I in this astral plane Anglican church teaching people about out-of-body travel. Why am I doing that? It was just too strange. This is early days where I'm not really ready for this information. I can handle it now. But 20 years ago, I'm like, what does this mean? You know, so I would say, and I've mentioned this to many people on discussion groups, you're always doing more out-of-body than you think you're doing. I, I want to make a point of clarification. When you say you're teaching, you're teaching are you saying you're teaching people who have a physical body, but they're asleep at night and they're out of their body? Sorry for the confusion, Gary. What I meant was I found I found myself what I knew was an Episcopal Anglican church. People are politely listening to me because they're in their consensus reality. They're, they've realized their dream of being a faithful Christian, and they've probably seen some representation of Jesus somewhere. You know, I, I'm not criticizing them in any way, but they under they get that there's more, and they want to. So they have people come to their church and give talks, whether it's on yoga or, you know, here I am telling them how to get to the formless levels. You know, most Christians don't understand that there's a formless level where there are no buildings, churches, cathedrals deities prophets it's just the radiant void now buddhists get that they know buddhists know all about the radiant void but christians don't so there i am telling them giving a, a, sort, a sort of a little guided tour with the meditation how to go to the radiant void and come back again because they're quite afraid of if you give up your personality it's gone forever and i i show them no no just go there for a while 
lose your personality, lose your character, and just be a radiant being, and then come back. That's how, that's what I gift them. With. And I was having that dream 25 years ago and thinking, oh, what does that all mean? <laughs> you know, but I understand the principle that, that Sally's making. There are lots of nighttime classes where people go when they're asleep. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I know I've done that. I probably did that in, in the 1980s, 1990s when I was having those lucid dreams where I was being taught stuff that I described earlier on. Um, I'm pretty sure I did that then because I was um, uh, you know, well, a newbie. <laughs> that was my point because you said you were teaching about astral travel and obviously yeah. uh, those on, on the other side don't need to astral travel. They're living that reality. So I'm assuming you were teaching people that were out of their body at night, maybe not even conscious that they were out of body, and that's another point I want to make. We all yeah. go out of body all the time. And I think you made the, the comment, we don't even realize how much we go out of body when we're sleeping physically here. Yes, I agree. We, we don't. And that's still an ongoing realization for me, because uh, partly because of all these uh, um, video uh, interviews that we see on YouTube now with people talking about their NDEs, right? And many of them will say, besides talking to their deceased loved ones, um, they'll say, well, I was told that I was there all the time, not just when I just died, right. you know, that I come regularly. So I've been trying to cope with that in my own work and thinking, okay, so how often am I out there doing stuff while I might be sitting reading a book in my armchair? You know, you have to wonder about that. So I am currently exploring that in the last year or two. In 2023, there's a series of YouTubes where I don't do any preparation. I just open up the YouTube, usually early in the morning, and I say, okay, who, who are we going to talk to now? Mm -hmm. And it's like a totally spontaneous decision. It turned out to be Alan Watts. It turned out to be, I uh, forget who else, but various people that I thought would be interesting. But I made the decision on the spur of the moment. And I went in a few seconds thinking, oh, is this going to work? Is this going to work? And it did. Mm -hmm. Wonderful so, quote here from Silver Birch. And it's yes. from Friday After Life Report. <clears throat> sure. You come to our world now, but you do not remember. Yes. Visit the spur spirit world every night. That is your preparation. Otherwise, it would be such a shock when you come here to start your real life in earnest. When you pass on, you will remember the visits. I thought that was apropos to what we were discussing. And Gordon is somebody who remembers a whole lot more than most. I, I wish I remembered more than I do. I've luckily brought back a few memories, but not yeah. as many as I would like. Do you have any suggestions for people who would like to try to bring back more memory of their nighttime excursions? Oh, yes, absolutely. My uh, advice would be think over the the spotty memories you've got of a lucid dream from that, that previous night as you go through your day. And when you have 15 or 15, 30 spare minutes at any time during the day, settle into a meditation and uh, shut your eyes and image what you remember from the lucid dream. And what you do then is you expand it. You walk into the, the little bit of memory that you've got and sort of push it backwards and forwards with your hands at the same time, sort of like it, it would be in an animated movie or something. You know, you're in a room and you push one wall and you push the other and the room becomes bigger. Mm -hmm. And that, that will work. It's worked for me years ago. And just trust your, trust your intuition, trust your imagination and just give yourself some time to do that. And you will be surprised what you will uncover. Yeah. A thought just came to me and, and a technique I've found helpful from w William Buhlman, when you're doing that, expanding that memory, say clarity now, clarity now. Oh, absolutely. Well, absolutely. There's, Gary, there's a section in my second book, which uh, More Advanced Eternity, where I'm trying, my guides are trying to push me away 
like their their swimming teachers kind of push me into the deep end of the pool and I'm going, oh, I can't swim by myself. I can't swim by myself. And it's, it's d described in detail. And in uh, the 2003 um, hostilities in Iraq, I was wanting to do, because I knew there'd be tons of retrieval work. And I got out of using Hemisync, used, got out of body and said to the guides, okay, uh, I need some help here. And they, they flatly refused to help me. No, do it yourself. I mean, they were quite rude, actually. <laughs> Come on, so they're, they're telling you to swim now. Yeah. So You're what happened training. was, I, I thought, I, how do I get to, a, believe it or not, I said to myself, how on earth do I get to Iraq? So um, uh, I remembered uh, William Bullman's, his book I had read before, um, The Clarity Now. Uh, command and I thought oh yeah I'll use that so I did the Iraq now command just mm -hmm. adapting it and suddenly I was there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's amazing to me now that I actually went through a stage where I said oh how do I get to Iraq <laughs> and really once you're you're fully in an out-of-body experience just a thought of a place will take oh, you. oh yeah absolutely I'll, I'll share a, a just a really brief one I, I was found myself out of body one night and I thought, hmm, I wonder what architecture in Cairo looks like. Boom, I'm on the streets of Cairo. And Very nice. Very I, nice. I, it's early morning. There are a mm. few people walking around. I kind of I look at the architecture. I kind of rise up and I see the pyramids in the background. Mm. Back in my body the next day, I'm thinking, well, that the pyramids are way out in the desert. They're not visible from Cairo. And then shortly thereafter, I saw a National Geographic on the cover is almost the exact same scene. The, the streets in Cairo with the pyramids in the background. Um, yeah, there's uh, many great revelations can be had <laughs> when you're asleep at night. And, and, and that was sort of confirmation and validation too, which was great. There's one uh, meditation I, I did years ago, several times on YouTube. You'd have to go back a few years to find it, but I'll tell you the essence of it. I had, at that time, I was doing a lot of YouTubes and I had quite a following. People would follow me from video to video. They're called um, the OBE journals, uh, 2017, 2018, and 2019. And one, one guided meditation I did several times was I would advise people, you know, that they all already knew all about going out of body and stuff, but I would guide them farther. And I would guide them up through the astral levels to the formless energy planes, just so that they could experience that. And I would would be stay there for 10 minutes or so and then come back. And since I'd already guided them to talk to their uh, departed loved ones, uh, or on whichever level, I would say, okay, now go back to any of your favorite departed loved ones that are living in the, the farm worlds in the summer land and try to tell them what we've just done. Mm. Because as, as I'm sure you and Sally know, lots of people that are comfortable in the summer land, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be comfortable, after a, a difficult, challenging life, a lot of people deserve to be comfortable. Sure, it's a vacation. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, um, it, it was an interesting exercise and I, I, I'll do it again sometime because what a lot of people should know is that what we're doing is um, what a lot of people on the astral plane, more conventional. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have a spiritual body. They do. They're spiritual people. They understand the values of kindness and love and compassion. They understand all of that. But they, what they don't get is the adventurousness that we're indulging in. Some do, so, but many don't. Yes. Uh, yeah. And it's just good for them to, to spread their wings. That's all. It's just like how people say, oh, travel broadens the mind. And of course, we know lots of people in North American society, as we're talking right now, can't afford to travel that much. And those that do benefit from it. But we all know if there was a government fund of $20,000, you, you want to go around the world, here's the $20,000, do it. You know, people, everyone would benefit from that. And it's really only money that's keeping them. Well, timidity a, a bit too. But so the travel on the astral plane uh, to the various levels is, is just as educative for those people that don't do it. And it's free of charge. Yes, and it's free of charge. 
So let me ask you another question really quick, Gordon, because sure. I want to be sure that we don't leave anybody too concerned or worried because we started yeah. out talking about rescue work. Yeah. And what are the conditions that would necessitate yeah. someone needing to be rescued from some place in the afterlife where they're really not meant to be? Right. Well, there's there's a variety of uh, situations that you'll encounter. The, the, the most simple and, and well-known are the things that have been covered in popular movies, like someone dying in a car crash and not knowing what happened. You know, it, it was covered in the movie, movie Ghost and The Sixth Sense and different things. They're, they're reasonably accurate, those movies. Those people, you'll find people standing by wreck. I, I think, didn't Gary just discover one a while ago? Standing by a wrecked car, not knowing what to do. And they're traumatized and they're freaked out. And, uh, you know, uh, the astral plane guides can't get a hold of them. So you and I have to do it. So there's that. Then there's all these people in war zones that have been blown out of buildings in seconds and barely know what's happened. In fact, they usually don't know what's happened. And um, they have to be uh, talked to. And uh, sometimes they're blown out of their bodies so fast that they don't they're, they're they're more confused than traumatized now of course if they've been buried under rubble in a in a building for 3 days before dying yes then they're traumatized but if they're blown out of their bodies extremely quickly by an explosion or a missile as some of my recent retrievals have been the damascus uh, situation and the, uh, the 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 crash in iran of the helicopter with the vips on it that, that happened very quickly. Those people barely knew what happened at all. So you, you, you have to sort of convince them, yes, you are dead. And yes, I am a guide. And no, I am not the spawn of Satan. Come to take you to hell. I'm going to take you to where you need to go. You have to do all that kind of stuff. So essentially, you have to be a fairly well-trained actor in a play. Much so like an Earth life, you have to be a well-trained actor. Yeah, exactly. Actor yeah, exactly. Gary, there's a lot of stuff, as you know, that's very, it's more similar to earth life, uh, uh, dealing with a, a tra traumatized child that's standing by a crashed car. is not that much different from dealing with a traumatized child who's lost his bike and is wandering around the neighborhood crying. I mean, sure. obviously it's a bit more serious, but it's not that different in terms of the role that you have to play. Exactly. And I think something I would like to add here that I think is very important, and I think you would concur. If you have a knowledge that the afterlife exists, if you do a little bit of research and begin to delve into this information, it's going to make your transition, however it transpires, far easier on you. If you have some background knowledge of the afterlife while you're still living. Yes, I, I, I certainly uh, I agree with your point there, Gary. But to, to refer to what we were discussing a few moments ago, all this stuff where we seem to be automatically projecting without trying, where people say to uh, near-death experienced people, well, you've been here several times before you die. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. So are we all doing that all the time? Are we all like talking to you know, your deceased grandfather or your deceased college buddy that died in a car accident 20 years ago or whatever, are we yakking to them and having a little bit of fun and then coming back to the body and not remembering? I yes. mean, are we all doing that? That's essentially what Silver Birch uh, was saying in the quote I read a few minutes ago. R right. So, I mean, as I said to you at, in response, I, I am currently exploring that, trying to do these um what I call spontaneous projections from the waking body right. to see what's going on. Now, uh, you won't have looked at these uh, projections from 2023, but, but let me tell you the scariest part of it was I did a couple, I talked to you know, spontaneous projections. And at one point I was told, okay, Gordon, now talk to people that are still living. And I said, oh, you're kidding, right? And they said, no, it's telepathy. You can talk to their soul. And so, as usual, spirit guides always throw something right at you that you're not expecting just to, to see how you'll cope. So in, in the space of a week, I talked telepathically to RFK Jr. and Vladimir Putin. And I let me tell you, that was strange. Well, and most mediums now will tell you that you can communicate with 
living uh, being, people in a physical body. You can have connection with people who are nonverbal. You can have connection with people who are in a coma. You know, there's yeah, actually yeah. a lot of access uh, that you wouldn't have otherwise, you know, imagined was possible. But when information comes through that couldn't otherwise be known, but it's about a specific living individual, then that just reinforces the idea that we are all spirit at our core. And so as spiritual beings, we can communicate with other spiritual beings embodied or not. And all interconnected. Right. Well, I certainly agree with you both on, on both points there, but I, I must tell you, I was, <laughs> I was terrified that people would take my conversation with Vladimir Putin the wrong way because I am not in support of his political goals. I just wanted to hear what he had to say. And Spirit said, go on, talk to him. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Talk to him. Is it something so you can share? <laughs> Well, um, I can't, I mean, this is done, this was done a year ago, Sally, it's on my uh, YouTube, uh, you can, uh, I, can okay. I can send you a link, I can't remember now what it was. Well, we can put the link, but, we can put the link on the description for the video. Yeah, and, and the same with RFK, I mean, I said to my guide, well, has he been asked about this? And they said, yeah, but he said he doesn't really know on a conscious level, but he is, his soul is talking to you. And I don't, I mean, I had no idea what he was doing physically at the time, maybe he was sleeping. But um, it was an experiment in which I was like fairly shocked, although to mention your point, Sally, I had communicated years before with people in comas. I knew about how to do that. But obviously you're, you're doing a healing sort of a thing there. And um, but with this, I, I was I was shocked. And then there was another one on the same series, which I can, I can send a link to where I'm talking to. Um, how shall I put it? Three uh, aristocratic ladies, one called Diana, one called Elizabeth, and a third. Now, who do you think that was? Diana's doing this really cool. I'm, I'm, you know, she's been there a while. She knows how to interact. She's going up to the recently dead Elizabeth and putting her arm around her and giving her little hugs. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be not too popular with some people. And I was just, I was just told that I could do it. So I went and there was another lady. Who was the third lady? I can't remember now. Oh, I think it was the um, Elizabeth's sister, M Margaret, that had died some years before. Yes. Well, yes, And I, I find I that um, the perspective from the other side uh, allows so much forgiveness and so much more understanding that we don't always achieve when we're here in the physical body. I've had yes. challenging relationships with families, but when they were living, that yes. now that they're no longer in a physical body, I have great relationships with. <laughs> I have oh, I see. Experience. Okay, cool, cool. I, I have the same experience um, that that people I had a difficult time with here, we've made amends, and it, uh -huh. it, uh -huh. it's a beautiful thing. And we actually are both aware of the role that we played for each other, um, and actually had discussions about it. So. Gordon, I really want to thank you for joining us today, uh, sharing some of your insights, wisdom, and knowledge. And uh, thank you for cha uh, channeling today. That was uh, definitely that was always welcome. And uh, maybe in the future, we'll have you back again to because an hour is never enough time. We could go on all day, I'm sure. But uh, if people, do you have a website? Do, if people want to get in touch with you, find out more about your, the work you're doing? Well, um, I do have all kind, all sorts of um, ways that you can get in touch with me. I would say uh, email is the best. Um, the website is, uh, <laughs> you're going to love this guy. The guy that was running my website, I haven't heard from him in five years. And every time I send him an email, I never get an answer. So I don't know where he is. I don't know anything about it. So I can't actually adjust my website, although people still, that's, you know, the word of God or whatever, people still look at it and, and get in touch with me. It's still there, but it's a little out of date. Okay. But um, certainly Facebook is a good way to get a hold of me. Um, okay. No problem there. Just friend me on Facebook or send me an email or, and certainly have a look at the, uh, the uh, word of God YouTube videos. There's loads of stuff there. Yes, there is. And in fact, and Gary uh, may not be aware of this, Gordon, but I'll go mm -hmm. ahead and say it out loud. 
Gordon has the soul of a poet. <laughs> Oh yeah, and uh, oh, in yeah. addition to his spiritual work, he shares poetry on Facebook. So if you are a poetry fan, be sure to go and look up some of the things he shared with reading poetry. Yes, it's one of my great loves is, is poetry, and there are many great contemporary poets in North America and uh, in the English speaking world that I know of. Many, many. I love that you shared that little little extra piece of yourself as well. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, no, no problem, dear. And just, <laughs> I hope we do another uh, connection sometime, Gary, because David Crosby's been waiting in the wings here, dying to say something. And when he heard that you were, we were going to close, he was like, oh, shucks. <laughs> We'd well, love to hear from David. We would love to hear from him. Yeah. So I'm we'll, a big we'll, fan. We'll certainly do it again. Gordon, thanks again for joining us. Thank you again, Gordon. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this content, please hit like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.